Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tomash for making himself available to speak to us today and also uh, to Colin uh, for uh, introducing us to Tomash and uh, Ventura uh, and facilitating today's talk. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the lands that we're meeting on today. We're meeting I'm personally uh, on Ghana land in South Australia. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and uh, pay respects to their uh, use of the land and their relationship with the land and water. And I know others here are not necessarily on Ghana land, but uh, are also on First Nations land in Australia. Uh, I'll hand over to Colin and he will uh, take over as MC for today. So uh, thank you to everyone who's attended. And for those watching the recording, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always here and happy to talk about evaluation. Okay, over to you, Colin. Good. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. And welcome, Tomasha. I can see Ventura's come on board now. Welcome, yeah. Ventura. I'm glad you can make it. Um, uh, Mark has mentioned that uh, in Australia we uh, honour our uh, Aboriginal heritage and I'm coming from the Nirrinjiri land down south of the Soria Peninsula at the moment. Um, but uh, I want to uh, talk a few words uh, of introduction of the context. Um, although I've been involved in evaluation since 1983, in fact, uh, my psychology department uh, colleague and PhD colleague, Anona Armstrong uh, met me uh, after she'd already started the first national evaluation conference in Australia in 1982 in a coffee lounge one day and said, you want to help me out running this thing? And so uh, in 1983, when I became the first research and evaluation manager for the Commonwealth of Australia, uh, setting up a pilot program budgeting system, uh, I got involved and she got involved with the Victorian government's program indicators. So back in 83, we started developing the second evaluation conference nationally for 1984. And then two years later, the 1986 conference. And from that conference, we passed a resolution at the end of the conference to form the Australasian Evaluation Society. And Anona was elected as the first foundation president. And I was a foundation committee member uh, and eventually went on to co-edit the journal and set up the a committee on Ethics and Standards. And so there's a bit of history uh, that I've been able to um, uh, impart and hopefully uh, it's relevant for our discussions today about the formations of uh, uh, international and local evaluation associations. I'm just gonna share a screen to give us a bit more context. Um, <clears throat> so um, if we can share a screen, uh, I've lost it now, where has it gone? <clears throat> um, there's the share screen going in a second. <clears throat> Can you see the shared screen of the slides? How's that? Yep, no problems. Yep, okay. So, <clears throat> so I've called this a journey. I, I think it's a real journey, hasn't it, been Thomas? Ups and downs and bumpy roads. Uh, it reminds me of the Osebisa song, where are we going? <laughs> where we'll get there? <laughs> um, so uh, I guess one of the things that uh, uh, happened is that um, uh, <clears throat> Tomash contacted me uh, through LinkedIn, and uh, I think it's it's important to realise that the, the international link networks have been facilitated by various means. So, in um, <clears throat> I think the very first thing you could say that started our internationalization of evaluation was in 1975, you can see this, the program evaluation standards. I got this second edition in 1994. <clears throat> um, and it was set up by, can you see that? The Committee on St uh, Standards for Education Evaluation on my screen with my, my mouse is moving around. Yeah, yes. we can see that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's really important to realise that the American Psychological Association, the American Evaluation Association, and various other educational associations and the Canadian Society of Study of Education realised that there was benefit of sharing 
evaluation standards and professionalization of evaluation across borders and across professions. So the psychologists, educators, uh, education managers, uh, and so on, uh, and psychometricians and statisticians set up this joint committee on evaluation and, and based in the uh, domain of education and evaluation. <clears throat> and I was privileged to be part of some of that with my formation of the first Committee on Ethics and Standards in Australia. And also I was invited uh, when I came to the American Evaluation Association's first collaboration with the Canadian Evaluation Association Society, sorry, they had the uh, a meeting of the American Evaluation Association in Canada at Vancouver in 95. So I uh, met then the AES president, Ellen Chernimsky. She was the head of evaluation for the US government's uh, office of general accounting office uh, in the executive of the president uh, in the US. And she was the most genial host and benefactor I was struggling to find where to go in this conference venue. She saw some poor lost little Aussie came over and said, hello, are you interested in the evaluation conference? I said, yes, I'm the president of the Evaluation Society from Australia, come to participate on behalf of my colleagues in Australia. And she said, ah, come along. So she followed me up and put me on stage with all the other presidents, other uh, venerable people in evaluation and uh, uh, I actually introduced her to Elliot Stern, who just got the Evaluation Society going in the UK. Um, so that, that was amazing. And I was able to form good relationships. I asked Ellen to come out in 97 to be our keynote speaker, speaker for the Evaluation Conference in Adelaide, which I convened. And unfortunately, she broke her knee <laughs> and wasn't able to come. But uh, there's been a long association between the American Evaluation Association and the Australasian or Australian Evaluation Society. And the Canadians, of course, because we've been Commonwealth com countries, there are Commonwealth countries in Africa that obviously have uh, kindred relations with Canadians. But the point I'm saying here now is that we now have this, um, I guess, uh, Evaluation Association Register Unfortunately, uh, AMA is not on the list yet. Tom Ash, we've got to get back to them to get that done. So where are you coming in from? Well, Tom Ash is in Matu Matuto, right? Matuto, yeah. And um, <clears throat> that's when the conference was held. You've had a bit of bad weather associated with uh, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, I suppose. But <clears throat> we're going back to now 2020, I got a, a LinkedIn message from you, Tomash, and uh, you asked me, here's the message. I'm from Mo Mozambique and now part of the team working on the process of creating an M&E association. Could you have any availability to discuss a bit and see how we could help each other? And I thought that was a really important outreach, which the Australasian Evaluation Society should reciprocate because we were given that similar outreach by the Americans and the Canadians. And so... Um, I accepted the invitation and I sent a whole pile of stuff, my papers on the history of evaluation, the guidelines on the ethical conduct of evaluation, which is in a, it's in a number of editions now. <clears throat> the Canadians have actually collaborated with us because we've had very similar approaches to uh, ethics and standards. So I also referred uh, Tomash and, and uh, Ventura to our CEO Bill Wallace and the two presidents, John Stoney and Kiri Parata, uh, who were very uh, hospitable and, and communicated with you, Tomas and, and, and Ventura, and sent along a whole lot of stuff about our strategic priorities and reconciliation plan for Australian Indigenous uh, uh, recognition, and our guide to ethics and standards, a professional learning competency framework and also a statement on evaluation in COVID. So these are two themes we'll be following up now. First of all, I think uh, it was important to, um, uh, to come to uh, the idea of what the AAMA, AAMA's strategic objectives were, <clears throat> Thomas. And, and this is something which I felt that was relevant for us to, you actually learn quite a bit in terms of strategic planning and working out where to go. So you, your objectives were as follows, promote the interaction and learning and professionalization of a public and private sectors of monitoring and evaluation. Well, 
as you learned and have done, we've formalized that through conferences as we did in the Australasian Evaluation Society. <clears throat> and then you facilitate a second objective, the development of cap capabilities and professional networks, the Evaluators Professional Learning Competency Framework, which we've developed, a similar thing. Objective three, development and documentation of quality monitoring and evaluation theory and practice. Well, in fact, that was always one of the things that the Evaluation Society was about, the theory and practice, not just the professional discipline, uh, but the Evaluation Journal is now quite well respected. Um, and then the ethics guidelines are mentioned. These are the two objectives that really got me interested in your conference, and that was advocate for the development of evidence-based policies and programs to enhance transparency and social accountability, a very laudable objective, which we could still learn from in this country. Uh, but also the other one, which is interesting, promote new evaluators and attracting students and recent graduates and professionalization, something which the IAS has always tiptoed around. We've always tried to be a professional association of the discipline of evaluation rather than a guild or a union or a collective of evaluators, which the American Evaluation Associations tended to be. So last but not least, we decided to share that through the uh, the LinkedIn network. And so um, you registered your organization in November 2020. Is that right, Tomas? Yes. And so from then on, we've had a, a, a vibrant, vibrant uh, network going on. And I'd like you to now carry on the story that I've, I've started. If you'd like to uh, say a few more words about how that came to be and what happened with the conference and the formation that you had? Um, thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. First, I would like to thank um, the Australian uh, um, Evolution Society uh, for bringing us in this uh, conversation and giving us this opportunity of sharing our experience. Well, <laughs> it's a long, uh, a long story. Uh, which started, it didn't even start in 2020, it started before, um, but uh, we've been struggling, we've been trying to do with Ventura leading some of, uh, most of the actions. I also joined, actually, <laughs> we met me and Ventura uh, after we have worked in the same company. And then when that's when we, we met and we said, okay, let's try to go with this, we want to make sure that, that this happens um, uh, in Mozambique. And um, I remember uh, when I started, uh, I, I was in a, in a group of discussion with uh, Jinra Sekan, uh, and uh, we had some discussion. That's when she said, okay, uh, you can talk with uh, uh, Dr. Colin and uh, maybe he can help you in the direction you want to take. So um, uh, in 2019, uh, there was a lot of discussions and 2020, we just cr started creating this uh, movement. How uh, did we create the movement? We created the movement uh, through WhatsApp, through communicate, uh, communication, through emails with, uh, um, with, um, with our colleagues. Uh, mostly when we started, it was mostly uh, people from NGOs. And we started communicating, and uh, we uh, just brought this idea of um, of uh, creating uh, the association. It was a challenge because when we started uh, trying to bring all uh, the set of things we needed to register the the, the, the the association, then it came COVID, and we're sitting in different places in Mozambique. We have people from northern side, we have people from central side, and everyone is far away. How? could we make sure that even this process is a, is a democratic we can we can include everyone in all this process so um it was a challenge it was a big challenge because things were shut down here uh, because of covid and even communication centers. so we decided okay uh, just to make sure that this idea doesn't go away let's just create 
um, a WhatsApp group where we will uh, organize like weekly meetings. Oh, that's when we started. Weekly meetings where we will bring uh, a, a speaker to share experience, to share vision in a, a monitoring and evaluation and things like that. And we have gone for that for almost six months doing that weekly. And even if we didn't have um, uh, a speaker, we could have at least uh, one of the key members of the, the association sharing the status update of the registration, uh, legal legal registration and so on. And um, in um, November, we managed to collect some money from, uh, from our members just to um, formalize the registration. And that that's when we said, okay, that this is done. We started contacting uh, uh, people, organizations like UNICEF, African Development Bank, uh, World Bank, and uh, USAID, and so uh, so many other organizations, uh, bringing this idea. And uh, we didn't bring just idea. We brought uh, like um, a concept note. What is our idea? What are we thinking? What we want to reach? We look to um to our market, and uh, I have been working in uh, monitoring and evaluation for more than fifteen years, and uh, Ventura as well have been working in monitoring and evaluation for a long time. So we said, okay, what is the biggest problem we have in our in our area in monitoring and evaluation? So we identified some of the points, and then we said, okay. If we are, we had to create an organization, what are we going to be um are we are, are we going to be doing and what um what um what um what are we envisioning and what support is going to bring to to people in Mozambique? So we said, okay, let's let's focus not in a lot of objectives, strategic objective, my but maybe uh four to five strategic objective to make sure that we focus. We want to focus and we want to help people. We want to make sure that uh, uh, that uh, people in this area feel that uh, there are people supporting them and they can get support internally. And uh, the other thing which brought us, which just seconded this idea was uh, like, okay, most of the time, uh, 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 we will um, get like uh, consultant services, we will get like um, uh, m activities, but we will not be uh, the principal people, we will be the second people and always NGOs will bring um, um, international uh, uh, consultants uh, uh, so to, to, to run this. So we will be like, um, okay, data collectors, and then we said, okay, it's not bad, but we need to look why um, NGOs looks to us as just data collectors. We need to understand that. It's not just saying uh, complaining, but we need to understand. And uh, we said, okay, I think we, we think we lack of um, uh, professional skills all right? Uh, high level professional skills. We lack of uh, these, um, experience and so on then that's why that's when uh all of this um uh idea all of these strategic objective for or we, we brought in and the idea was okay if we want to make sure that we are recognized then let's be professional let's be good prof professional it's not just asking someone to hire you and then when you are there you're not able even to perform your job. So let's create this to make sure that we can provide capacity building to people. We can provide, uh, 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 we can help them improving their skills. We can bring this idea and we can also create a mean, uh, uh, this mean which which can like um, guide the evaluations in Mozambique. And that was the idea. And um Yes, we brought this in idea in our uh, in our in our strategic planning, and also uh, we decided to do the first conference. Uh, it was a challenge to do the first conference. Uh, we secured um, uh, funding from UNICEF to two thousand twenty one. 
uh unfortunately uh covid-19 streak again and uh, we didn't um uh foreseen this doing uh like um uh, like uh, online event we wanted to have at least people sitting together discussing ideas bringing uh the ideas and things like that so we said okay let's postpone it and let's wait uh for the right opportunity to do that and uh unicef said okay uh, i'm able to fund you fund you guys uh 100 percent we went to other organizations, uh, African Development Bank. They said, "Okay, we will fund you half of that. If uh, if uh, there's no, if there's uh, another one to fund, we can do that." And we went to uh, other organization like Clusa. Uh, they said they will help us and and things like that. So at the end, when we started, people were like, "Oh, okay, maybe it's um." something which is coming and then it's it will disappear but then when they saw that uh, the idea it's there and this is staying uh organization starting uh, um started uh, wanting to be part of uh, of uh, of m and &E. and i remember for example in 2022 there was a uh, this new phase of um of a monitoring service from USAID uh they launched uh, they launched the, the 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 opportunity and all organizations who were applying to this opportunity they will come to us and uh, and ask for a letter of uh, of support so that they can apply for that and that was not a require from USAID but then that's when we saw that okay um we are bringing this uh, importance in uh, in country and we want to to move on on that um yes currently um we are uh, uh, almost 500 members uh we still have some our struggles but we are moving there and then when we started organizing this conference we reached a lot of people outside international uh, uh international uh guests and we managed to to have guests, uh, for example, our guest speaker, one of our guest speakers was Dr. Colin, and we have Dr. David, uh, and we have also uh, uh, people from uh, Canadian um, Evaluation Society, from American Evaluation Society. We had also the Vice President of European uh, Evaluation Society. So we had all these kind of people and all of them, they were interested in joining and sharing their experience and giving this support so that we could, we could boost um um our our presence in 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 country and uh, there was a lot of good uh discussion and uh, and uh, and uh, dr Colin can say that and we we appreciate because it was late tonight to dr Colin. Uh, initially he said um he won't participate in the whole conference but since the discussion was very active was very good he managed to stay the whole um, sessions, the both days. So that was a, a very good opportunity for us. And that discussion brought us ideas. What are the next steps? What do we want to do? What do we want to create? What kind of movement we want to bring um, in Mozambique? So in short, this is uh, 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 the experience I could bring uh, from uh, from Mozambique for now in terms of monitoring and evaluation. One of the challenges you will oversee is that um, uh, we are like starting because this thing of monitoring and evaluation was brought mostly from uh, NGOs and most of material they're in English and we're Portuguese speaking countries. So imagine what kind of challenge we go through just to make sure that we read material, we get material, we get the right material, we read that and we learn uh, something from that and we can perform our activities, we can do what we do. So it's a big challenge, but we're we are working. And um, for example, uh, 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 this year we had also one opportunity. Uh, we had a request, uh, Ventura, maybe if uh, he's still here, uh, he will share uh, clearly this idea, but we we had a request from University of uh, Antwerp uh, 
uh, where they said, okay, we had um, we had um, we wanted to support maybe two to three um, professionals from Mozambique to come here and have a two two weeks uh, training in monitoring and evaluation. And uh, these people who went there, they just went because we we had to give them this letter of support and uh, the university news that these people are coming from AMA, so which is very, very good for us. And uh, these people will bring this experience, will share this experience with the rest of the team. That is our expectation. That's why we're thinking we need to build this capacity. We're working also with a clear Lusophon, clear, a clear lab in terms of making sure that we have sessions where we advise, we provide uh, counselment to uh, new um, monitoring and evaluation professionals. And uh, we oversee um, we see the opportunity also to of linking with capacity building institutions, and uh, recently after the and 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 the fun thing is that uh, even though we were not registered to Afreya when we organized our conference, but we managed to bring the president of Afreya to participate in person in our conference. Yeah. So, so just to, sorry, uh, Thomas, can you? Explain for the, uh, us who don't know these uh, acronyms. AFREA oh. is the African Evaluation Association, yes? Exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. And also, yeah. uh, we neglected to actually pronounce what AMMA stands for. Can you um, say it for us in Portuguese? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So AMMA is Association Moçambicana de Monitoria Avaliação. So... Mozambican Monitoring and Evaluation Society. So this is yes. something I wanted to bring up because uh, one of your keynote speakers, um, Dr. David Amayal, uh, I may have not pronounced that correctly, but he, is that right? A-M-A-E-W-Y-A-W. Uh, Dr. Amayal was uh, a regular speaker in your conference. And he came, he said he visited Australia in 2018 and was impressed with the government use of monitoring and evaluation. So one of the things I guess that we don't usually mention monitoring and evaluation as the, uh, the key uh, foundations of the Australasian Evaluation Society. But in fact, uh, monitoring and evaluation is obviously an important factor for the NGOs to have the reporting framework for accountability uh, and register, uh, the regulatory involvement for independent funders and donors for the NGOs. So can you say a little bit about the importance of that in terms of how those donors make those regulatory requirements of monitoring as well as evaluation? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so in Mozambique, I think all of the NGOs they have they have this requirement of having a monitoring and evaluation in their systems, mm. but which is different with the government. The government yeah. is starting now uh, to require monitoring and evaluation in all ministries, and mm. we have even uh, uh, someone sitting in the presidential uh, uh, house uh, for monitoring and evaluation. But they they are starting. The idea here is to bring this 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 aid this uh, this monitoring piece just to make sure that they 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 know where they are going they make sure that they understand what they are doing before they just end up uh, 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 um, doing things and uh, by the end they see that they were going to the wrong direction mm -hmm. so um that is what is driving yeah. it's uh, it came to a point where it's not just a requirement from the donors but it's something they see that is useful for their program management. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, obviously uh, it's uh, tied to the funding arrangements, the monitoring, uh, and the evaluation is funded for, is uh, a percentage of that budget you've been given. Like that's how the Americans created an industry of uh, evaluators back in the 1960s is, is the federal government required at least 1% of the budget provided to a program such as an educational uh, uh, Head Start program for deprived, uh, poor, uh, 
socioeconomically disadvantaged children, uh, the, the millions and millions of dollars provided from federal government to states with the proviso string attached, that at least 1% of each grant for each state had to be spent on independent evaluation. So along with the monitoring of the regular reporting and, and budgetary uh, and other accountable arrangements, then there's the additional aspect of independent evaluation. Is that a similar arrangement you have now in, in uh, Mozambique through the uh, various development banks and donor arrangements? Yes, it's um, it's similar. It's similar. That's uh, one thing. Uh, that that's something which happens. Or not only in Mozambique, in even the region. I have I had this opportunity of uh, also working with uh, countries in uh, in the region here, and I have seen that that is how things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this requirement, mm -hmm. and but now it not just come like a requirement. Someone is asking you to do but it comes as something which is important to make sure that we know where we are going. Mm. So one other thing that came out of the conference very strongly, and as I said, it was the sixth of your strategic objectives, is the idea of professionalisation of evaluators, which I was pleased that Dr. Um, David Emilio uh, talked about Australia, but I wasn't too pleased when he said that he said that everyone here, every one of us here in the conference should be certified as a qualified in evaluation. And I think that that kind of grated a little bit with our tradition here. So, for example, I started out as a psychologist involved in evaluating as a program manager. And I've always seen evaluation as an important management tool not just as an independent accountability requirement, but ironically, I then ended up being the first person to set up program budgeting for that evaluative arrangement for the federal government. So, uh, but the AES has always uh, promoted the idea of professionalization and professionalism, but not requiring people to be certified as practitioners or certified as members. And, and I think that's a trend that's been discussed quite some time. The Americans and Canadians have toyed with it, but it hasn't really taken off as in some other professional groups like the Ergonomic Society and the Australian Psychological Society, of which I was a member. You have to be certified to be a practitioner. How is that working now in the HVAC and countries? And what was the upshot of that discussion in the Mozambique conference? Okay, thank you. Uh even in Mozambique, even in our prayer countries, it's not like a mandatory for you to have a certification in monitoring and evaluation to work on that. Even myself, when I started working in monitoring and evaluation, I didn't have a, a certification of that. Even I was an was a informatic person, a technology person, but I went to work as a monitoring and evaluation officer. So uh, even now, I would say in Mozambique at least, maybe... I would say more than 95% of people, they don't have certification of that. The idea behind of the certification is that these areas uh, attract a lot of funds and people just come like, a, it's a simple thing to do. And what we have seen in most of the organization, we have even people who uh, don't understand very well about numbers, about the, uh, the indicators and things like that. But since they think it's a very simple thing to do, let me just go there. So yeah. that's where this idea came from. It's not just like a university certification. What we are looking for is make sure that at least someone has a, a, a minimal capacity building Mm -hmm. on monitoring and evaluation, at least to understand uh, indicators, understand uh, frameworks, and uh, understand all of that things uh, when they go there. Because most of the time we hire someone because he just went to YouTube, he went to internet and read the lot and things like that, and he is able to respond to the question, but let's do the work. He's not mm -hmm. able to do. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the idea behind. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think we, we should be opening up for any questions uh, fairly soon. Is there anything else you'd like to say just to wrap up before we open for questions? Um, yes, I'll, maybe what I'll do is that uh, our vision has um, uh, AMA is to make sure that uh, our professional, they are 
of high quality that organization NGOs are able to trust people or professionals from Mozambique. The other point is to make sure that the government recognize this movement and make sure that they understand the use of evaluation. And when we are doing evaluation, it's, all, it's not just for a sake of, uh, uh, of doing something which is planned, but it's doing to use it mm -hmm. to inform yeah. their decision. Yeah. Indeed, Michael Patton's theme uh, for many years, uh, and I was fortunate to, to to work a little bit with Michael and be attending of his various workshops, is utilisation-focused evaluation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so can we open up for questions, Mark? Do you want to uh, organise that, or should we go through the chats and see uh, what we've got with the chats? The chat, we've got uh, John to ask a, a question. Uh and partly, I think some of it might have been covered, but I'll uh, repeat it just so you can clarify anything, mm -hmm. Tomash. Uh, what are the main drivers, motivation for evaluation? Is evaluation a condition of funding agreements and or using evaluation to improve policy decisions? So I guess we come back to the use. Uh, and maybe uh, I know you've touched on bits of this, you can clarify, but uh, also just to add to John's questions, have you seen any of the evaluation findings change decisions or improve programs uh, so far? Um, yes, but it's very difficult to see, especially when we talk about the government. Uh, they are still like uh, not willing to take, they will even approve uh, you to conduct the evaluation. But after you bring the report, they'll just put that report under the desk and it's done. It's just to make sure that they follow the procedures as they agreed uh, with the funding, but not yeah. to use it. Mm -hmm. But recently we have seen some of the government department not using 100%, but at least relying a little bit on what was uh, main findings from 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 the evaluations and that is a, 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 a open door for us to make sure that we push more uh, from them and we make sure that they understand the importance of not just doing the evaluation uh, but also using this evaluation to inform police uh, police making and um, I will just give a quick example on that I remember uh, I participated in, in a movement where we work in some police development through USAID, and we brought some good uh, findings uh, from, from evaluation we did on ground. And uh, the team sit down and they decided to think again what they, they were bringing that police making. And uh, that was a little bit of change and even the government officials, they agreed to change based on that uh, evaluation findings. So it's not a lot, but it's something which we see that maybe we can work on that direction and it can improve. Thank you for that, Tomas. John, you've got a uh, raised hand, so if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Thomas, for your presentation. Um, here in Australia, we have, have, I suppose, seen several examples of um, government departments and even um, NGOs where where they try to build evaluation in as a management tool, as what you know, Colin was alluding to, um, not as an accountability mechanism, but as a as a um, a learning process. Um, but uh, many of those examples. Um, I'd say have failed and then we find that evaluation has quickly just become an accountability exercise. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my question is, um, are you seeing examples in Mozambique where, whether, whether it's a government department or an NGO or, or a private organisation, where they're trying to build evaluation in um, their organisational capability? In other words, they're doing it not as an accountability mechanism, mm -hmm. but they're doing evaluation as a program development um, purpose, which is you know what Colin said, how basically um, he started out with evaluation, or is um, 
evaluation is still largely just an accountability mechanism. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, from what from my experience, from what I've seen, uh, I know maybe only one company which uh works like okay which uh works in a different direction but most of uh ngos they do evaluation they do monitoring as part of uh, accountability not as a um, like um as you mentioned like a, a direction they decided to follow right but as uh, to make sure that um, it's um uh, they are, they are accountable uh, on what they are doing but when I say that I have seen one organization uh, doing that, it's only one I've seen. Uh, maybe there's another, but I know only one uh, where they built this evaluation has a has a has a, a culture of that organization, not yeah. just as a not just as a, as a as a as a accountability process. Yeah, but we just... are far behind. behind. So I have, to, I think I have to reply to John's comment that it hasn't really worked with internal evaluation uh, involvement. Uh, having been involved in helping to set up internal evaluation processes, I think there is an element that John's correct that a lot of these processes in Australia haven't been as effective as you would have hoped because the senior executives haven't actually developed that culture of actually being evidence based in their decision making or haven't focused on the strategic value, as it were, in terms of decision-making, that evaluation could be an important part of strategy. Uh, and so, yes, there's quite often a lip service paid internally, but where there have been executives involved that have hired me to help develop people internally, uh, for a time, there has been some serious uptake of evaluation and improvement. But as usual, when the CEOs change, it can all dissolve. Yeah. <laughs> and when governments change, it can all dissolve. Um, That's I didn't want to hold up Kexima. You want to, he's the next uh, person with a hand up. Have you two Kexima? Yes. Yes, good, good morning. Uh, good day, everyone. And thank you for, for uh, this uh, wonderful discussion. I, I, I wanted to uh, get back to, to a point that Colin raised recently on the, on the issue of certification. Um, it, uh, and thank you for sharing uh, the experience that you have in, in Australia, where, where it's, it, there, there are no clear boundaries uh, in terms of professional uh, um, linked to, to, to uh, certification. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we are seeing um, this is an experience in Mozambique. We are seeing a, 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 a movement of um, training institutions being created almost every day, uh, issuing certificates um, to uh, prof professionals. And uh, we, we raise this question who certified this institution? Who, who are credited this institution? How how um, strong is this institution to to really provide and give this uh, this uh, this certification as a professional to this to these individuals? And then because we know that at the end of the day, uh, if I'm recruiting a professional in evaluation, uh, I would rather take one with a certification with a certificate that uh, compared to the, 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 the the other person that's yeah. so how do we ensure that there is real value in the certification process that is being followed in the country and uh, uh, I, I also wanted to to take it uh, to the role of uh, the, the evaluation society and see uh, from your experience what role has uh, the Australian evaluation society played in, uh, in uh, ensuring that there is real um, uh, yeah. credibility in this certification yeah. process. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Kashiro. I, I believe there are two things I could say about that is um, for some time there were at least three universities that had a strong academic uh, um, staff members uh, and, and a curriculum 
uh, in running degrees that had evaluation. For example, I ran a master's program in the Flinders Institute of Public Policy and Management for 10 years, which had an internal and internal audit and internal evaluation as an elective in the management courses in the master's program. In Melbourne University had the Center for Evaluation, which had master's degrees in evaluation. Curtin University and, and others, Sydney a long time ago, had training and education uh, qualifications that were registered with Australian qualifications framework uh, through universities. Unfortunately, that's dissolved quite a bit. When I left Flinders in 2004, that stopped, basically uh, 2005 and six. Uh, was carried on for a short while. Uh, the last university standing with a strong staff uh, co contingent in evaluation is left as Melbourne University, and they're focusing more on educational evaluation. So the IES has now, for a long time, run workshops uh, associated with each of its national conferences, has had regional groups running seminars, have set up the... Um, evaluate its professional learning competency framework and required uh, people like, such as myself and John and others who run workshops as a part of a, a, a broader AES developmental program that have been required to comply with the evaluators professional learning competency framework in the training courses and other things that are provided. But they're not accredited through universities. These are done as short courses for uh, basically people's uh, professional development rather than certification. So we really haven't developed the capacity for that certification in a, in a, a regulatory manner. The Canadians have, but they've still made it voluntary. So their competency and, and uh, certification process is a voluntary one, and they, like the Australasian Evaluation Society, provide regular workshops associated professional development workshops associated with their conferences and their regional groups, such as this regional group in South Australia. We've hosted a number of conferences and regular uh, seminars, but they're not strictly certification uh, 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 processes. I hope that answers your question, Casimo. Did you want to comment, Thomas? No, well, uh, that's, that, 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 that's what we said. And I, I remember during the conference, um, um, Dr. King said, uh, it's not just about creating institutions to certify people, but who certify these institutions. Yeah. We need to set up, uh, we need to set up a framework, yeah. uh, uh, just to make sure that we certificate this. Yeah. Uh, it's not just bringing this, uh, uh this course there and uh, without certification. Yeah. So, yes, you're right. That is long. Yeah. So I think John's probably got something to add <laughs> to this. Yeah, uh, interestingly, th there's one pocket of certification in Australia. So the Victorian government, um, as part of its, um, bis uh, when, when the individual departments want to put up a business case for a large investment, um, they have to include in that what we as evaluators would call program logics and theory of change. So they don't use that language. Um, but in the state of Victoria, uh, to make a, a, a for government department wants to put forward a, a, an application to Treasury for a substantial investment for a new program or infrastructure, um, they part of it is a requirement to include what we would call a logic model and theory mm -hmm. of change. Yeah. That part of it um, has to be undertaken by a person who's certified by the Victorian government. Mm -hmm. Now, so they don't call it evaluation. They don't use the term logic model. They don't use the term theory of change. Yeah. But yeah. I can't. But um, their requirement, their business requirement, is that you're when you're putting up a business case, you have to include that element, which yeah. we would call logic model and theory of change, and that element has to be done by a person who's certified to do that type of technical work yep. so it's not so it's interesting interesting how the victorian government um has formalized that requirement um and and they've set up a training program for people to become certified so i know, know a number of evaluators who have paid the money to come to come certified in that particular methodology yep. and which allows them then to be the certified person who contributes to the business case 
Yeah. So uh, just to, sorry to finish off that, John. Uh, they, uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Commerce in Victoria hired me years ago to help run workshops on capacity building and to set up a maturity model of evaluation uh, as a part of their uh, career development and their developmental program for internal capacity in evaluation. So, as I mentioned, Nona Armstrong was hired by the Victorian government back in the 1980s to set up performance indicators for uh, uh, accountability requirements and improvement of, uh, of uh, evaluation as a basis. And the existing master's degree in evaluation is in Victoria. So Victoria's had a strong uh, influence on the culture of evaluation in Australia uh, and have continued to require that uh, uh, competency and capacity. But it doesn't always work, and it's sometimes actually the the, bro the, the program I was involved in immediately uh, dissolved after uh, my contract finished and the senior people involved left and the department people executive changed. So it lasted maybe nine months after my training program that was involved. So, so with the best intentions and the best culture and the strongest commitment uh, in Victorian departments, these things don't always have complete traction and longevity. Sorry, David, I keep interrupting. So sorry, over to you, David. Um, yeah, well, you actually raised two more points that I want to talk about. My first point is that one of area in Australia, at least, where <clears throat> there is a strong culture of uh, continuous improvement and reflecting on practice and looking at evaluations is in the emergency management space. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wondered if maybe um, Mozambique might have that and whether you could try and engage with some of those people and see what's happening and, and there may be some uh, synergies with the work that you're doing in Mozambique, so just as I'm done a little bit of work with um, the National Emergency Management Authority here in Australia, and they're very interested in making change, learning from the mistakes. I think it's worth well, so cool. they may well <coughs> provide a model that you might be able to use. Mm. Uh, we'll come back to that. The other thing I should say is that. The investment logic accreditation that's just been talked about is a commercial operation largely. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, uh, it's available, uh, it's an international thing and it's available. Um, so the, and the training courses are basically handled by uh, a commercial company or they they may license some training, but they, they do that. So. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, which has gone out of my head, um... <laughs> sorry, David, that's my yeah, fault. No, that's right. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's probably enough. We haven't got much time. Left. So, no. Tom, I said, I mean, I wondered if you'd thought about um, the emergency management space. Hmm. How much? So has there been a, 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 an interest and commitment and co capacity building in emergency management for m and &E in, in uh, African countries or Mozambique? Um, <clears throat> there is, um, but as I mentioned, not from the government, uh, mostly from uh, NGOs, from uh, companies evaluation companies so there, there is that that that's that's why also we think that this is a a, a way to go to make sure that uh, first we, we we have these people uh, understanding what they are doing uh, prof uh professionalizing uh their work before we we claim anything so um there is this movement yes yeah so i should say that there are two other things that we should give credit for Australia. Uh, in 1994, the uh, Australian Youth Foundation hired me to set up an evaluation framework and provide training courses. And I was involved with 10 years with them uh, developing their field youth workers uh, as evaluating their own programs using an evaluation framework under the start do-it-yourself evaluation framework 
uh, manual which I developed and they used for 10 years. Then the government decided to merge their association and my contract ended and that was the end of that program after 10 years and not much to show for it. The other one was uh, at an evaluation conference back in the 96, uh, 98, um, the Defence Department talked to me about helping set up a VET uh, qualification. In, in Australia, we have higher education with the universities, but we also have a very strong vocational education and training uh, capacity through our TAFE, and, and uh, there's a separate regulatory body that regulates vocational education and training. And the Department of D Defence, which itself is largely involved in a lot of training, uh, decided to set up an evaluation diploma, a VET diploma. And I was in, instrumental in helping them get the competency statements and the training program uh, curriculum sorted out to the point where we had an outline and then the various officers left and that was the end of that program after nine months. And we never actually got to run any training. So, but there, there's a, an intention there to run this uh, I've always said, as both an internal evaluator and an external uh, capacity builder and manager, both sides are important, as in auditing. Auditing is a good model. Internal audit is important to help establish the frameworks of controls within an organisation, an absolutely essential backbone of a lot of operations, right? But external evaluation is there for the regulatory requirement for accountability and transparency for the financial viability of the organisation. And the two really complement each other and work together. And I've always seen evaluation as a similar uh, process, that where I worked as an external consultant, I was able to work better with the organisation when there was someone internally who took the ball and was able to set up and work with internal audit or work with mo monitoring and evaluation. When I was an internal uh, evaluator working, I found it difficult when external evaluators were imposed with separate frameworks, separate agenda that were uh, hell-bent on being totally independent without consultation with the internal uh, staff, internal auditors and evaluators, didn't always work when there was that blindfolded, separate uh, uh, um, commitment to be totally independent. Well, John would John probably could comment on that, having done a lot more external evaluation work than I have. I'm just conscious on the time. I think that's a, a big big discussion for another day. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I I'm just conscious of time because I've something I'm working on at the moment resonates with what you're saying. But in the interest of time, I won't make any more comment on that. Yeah, that's probably a, a good spot to stop, given we've reached the, the hour mark. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's attended, but especially I'd like to thank Tomash for uh, making himself available to talk to us about his experience in Mozambique and also for uh, Colin for, again, arranging it, but also sharing his uh, wise words as well. Um, on that uh, note, I'd like to wish everyone who's in Mozambique or other parts of Africa, a good morning. And those who are in Australia, uh, a good evening 